where we left off in the last video, Napoleon was doing pretty well. In 1804, just as a bit of review, he declared himself emperor. Emperor Napoleon Napoleon the first. And then the whole last video was about the third coalition that formed in 1805. And we saw that at the end of 1805, after the Battle of Austerlitz, Napoleon was able to crush the third coalition. Crush the third coalition, which was mainly made up of Russia and Austria. And this is all review. We saw this in the last video. Russia, Russia and Austria. And the big byproduct of that, other than the fact that it just made everyone think, gee, this Napoleon guy, he's pretty formidable, is that it ended the Holy Roman Empire, which we remember is neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. It was really just a collection of uh, Ger German-speaking states. But it ended, it ended the official Holy Roman Empire. Holy Roman. Empire. And Napoleon felt so good about himself at this point, especially after crushing the the Austrian and Russian forces at Austerlitz, that he had the Arc de Triomphe, which if you go to if you go to Paris right now, it's one of the things you should see. He he had this built, and now it's to commemorate all of the soldiers who have died for France, but it was originally built by Napoleon to or co or it was commissioned by Napoleon to celebrate his victory at Austerlitz. So this is the Arc Arc de, my spelling is always a little weak, but it's especially weak when I'm spelling something in French. Arc de Triomphe. And that's right there. So Napoleon was, was doing pretty well. Now, on the other side of the equation, you could imagine that the other uh, major powers of Europe were kind of licking their wounds. They, were, uh, they, they weren't sure what was going on, and they were starting to feel threatened. And in particular, this guy started to feel especially threatened this is frederick this is frederick frederick once again my spelling is not the strongest especially when i'm doing something in german frederick will wilhelm the 3rd it actually took me a long time to realize that Wilhelm and William are the same names, that William is just the english version of it but this is frederick wilhelm the 3rd and he is the king of prussia he is the king of Prussia. And he stayed out of the action during the Third Coalition. And even now, Prussia is a major European power. And he gets threatened by this rising power of Napoleon, who was able to break up or almost take away Austria's influence from the Holy Roman Empire. And now it kind of becomes, you know, becomes this confederation of the Rhine. Let me show you the map. So this whole area over here, this whole area, let me make sure I'm drawing. This whole area, right? Well, this, all of this, right over here. These that, which, which is now mainly modern-day Germany, that used to be the Holy Roman Empire. Its emperor was the king of Austria, who wasn't necessarily in it, but it kind of implied some type of allegiance. Once he trounces, once this is France right here. Once he was able to trounce Austria in the in Austerlitz. Austria and Russia, then this becomes the Confederation of Rhine, Holy Roman Empire. Let me let me highlight this a little bit better. So this general area, Holy Roman Empire no longer exists, and it now becomes kind of a satellite region of France. France has a huge amount of control. So you can imagine that the King of Prussia starts getting a little bit threatened. France is on its borders. It's a it's it's shown itself to be able to defeat other great powers with ease. So this guy gets a little paranoid whether uh, he feels that France might kind of uh, threaten uh, Prussia's power, or maybe it's on the other side of the equation that he just didn't like this upstart who is not related to all of the other uh, all of the other royalty of Europe. He maybe wanted to put him in his place. So Frederick Wilhelm the Third declares war. Declares war. We're now in 1806. So we're now in 1806. We have Prussia. Prussia declares declares war. War on 
France. And you're going to see this pattern multiple times. And the one thing to kind of remember, if you just want to remember kind of major themes, we're always talking about the first coalition, second coalition, third coalition, fourth coalition, all of these. And it's always some combination of Britain. And Britain has kind of already dominated the ocean. So when we talk about these, these battles on land, we're not talking about Britain much. But this whole time, Britain's in the background trying to be a pain in France's neck. And then all of the other coalitions are some combination of Prussia, Austria, and Russia, and some other countries here and there. But you see one after another that they keep challenging Napoleon up to this point. And Napoleon keeps trouncing them, takes more and more land and territory and power from them. And they get even more insecure. And then they want to uh, form other coalitions. So this happens again. And this is the start of the fourth coalition. The last video was the third. Then this is now the formation of the fourth fourth coalition. And essentially, the coalition forms as soon as someone else other than Great Britain joins the fight, because Great Britain is kind of in a continuous war with Napoleon over this entire time period. So we've got this fourth coalition that forms. We've got Prussia. We've got Great Britain. And Russia wants to join the fight again. So as you can imagine, the end of the third coalition uh, didn't keep Russia out of the fight for long. So you also have, so let me write it down. You have Prussia, Russia and Great Britain. There's always some other actors, but these are the major ones. Great Britain. And it was kind of silly on the part of Prussia, because Prussia would have been in a much better situation if it had helped the third coalition. Maybe that would have changed the outcome. But now they're kind of taking on Napoleon, at least initially on their own, because Russia is always kind of behind Austria or Prussia, depending which coalition you're talking about. So uh, Prussia and Austria are always the first line of defense. In this case, in the fourth coalition, it's Prussia. And they get trounced. They get trounced in Jena Aurstedt. Let me show you where that is. So this is actually Napoleon getting the troops together for at Jena Aurstedt. This right here is, is a charge of the French troops there. Let me write this down. This is Jena, Jena Aurstedt. Aurstedt, two cities close by each other in Germany. They're roughly. Roughly around here. I don't, let's see, this map is a little difficult to read, but they're roughly in that area right there. They trounce, Napoleon once again, he trounces Prussia. So Prussia's just out of the way. That's in, that's in October of 1806. So this right here, this right here is in October. And then Napoleon essentially chases the Russians through most of what's now Poland. So he chases the Russians through most of what is now Poland. He has this hugely bloody stalemate at Aylo. I don't even know how to say that. It's right around there, if, I'm, if I read my maps correctly. So he's stalemate. Stalemate. This is in, this is in 1807. Stalemate. February 1807 at. At, let me get the spelling right, E-Y-L-A-U. Super bloody. He, they actually win the battle, but they aren't able to decisively defeat the Russian troops and or the Russian army. And there are estimates that in that one battle, there's anywhere from 15 to 25,000 casualties on both sides, which is huge at that time. I mean, even now, you know, if you think about even modern wars, that's a major amount of casualties to have in just one single battle. But Napoleon persists, and he's event, event, uh, eventually able to decisively, decisively meet the Russians at Friedland, which is right about there. This is Friedland. Friedland, right there. That is in June, in June of. 1807. And then he's able to decisively defeat the fourth coalition. So here we have, we're at, we're kind of at the summer of 1807. We're at summer of 1807 right here. 1807, we're talking about June is when Friedland occurs. Russians decisively defeated. The Prussians were already trounced several months ago. And then June, and then in July of 07, July of July of 1807 you have France signing the Treaties of Tilsit the Treaties of Tilsit 
And it's called the Treaties of Tilsit instead of the Treaty of Tilsit because he signed separate treaties with Russia and Prussia. At this point, Napoleon had kind of lost all respect for Prussia, and he wanted to show it. So he had a separate treaty with Prussia and a separate treaty with Russia. The one with Russia was a lot more respectable. It had all this language about how Napoleon and Tsar Alexander the One are now friends. This is this is Tsar Alexander I right here. This is Alexander one and as you'll see this friendship is very temporary as you could imagine i mean this was the guy napoleon defeated at austerlitz not too long ago so you know all this friendship should probably be written in quotes but the treaty with russia was very friendly and that's i think napoleon still respected still respected russia's power so it you know friendly with russia it declared them it declared them allies friendly with russia but it took but it kind of carved up the other treaty of Tilsit with Prussia, carved it up. Carved up Prussia. And the main thing it did, if we look at this map here, this is a map of Central Europe, or I guess you know the, the, the Prussia and Austria and France at the end of the Third Coalition. The main thing it did, it took the territory west of the River Elbe from Prussia. So this is the River Elbe right here. That right there is the River Elbe. The blue is Prussia after the Third Coalition. So all of this stuff gets taken away from Prussia, and most of it turns into a French satellite kingdom called the Kingdom of Westphalia. So this is part of the Prussian Treaty of Tilsit. So you have the Kingdom of Westphalia, Kingdom of Westphalia. And to really emphasize it really is a French satellite state, and to add insult to injury to the Prussians, Napoleon puts his brother Jerome as king. So Napoleon's, Napoleon's brother, Jerome. Jerome becomes king. So it really is a satellite state of France. So here at the end of this, you know, the other powers in Europe haven't learned that this Europe that this that that this Napoleon character with his grand arm, this huge army that he's been able to raise and his his military tactics really is someone formidable to deal with. And so they keep, you know, third coalition, then they lose territory, then the fourth coalition, then they lose even more territory. And what happens at the end of this fourth coalition, and actually during the fourth fourth coalition, after Napoleon defeated Prussia, he realized, gee, you know what? I have I've either in direct control or an in indirect control in, in of a significant part of Europe. And at the same time, he knew that Britain had complete domination of the oceans. And it was this kind of rouse, rising industrial power, you know, it was the beginning of the uh, industrial revolution. So Napoleon's idea is, well, you gee, I can't defeat Russia on the on the waters. I'm sorry, I can't defeat Great Britain on the waters. Did I say Russia? No, I've been saying uh, the whole point is is that uh, Great Britain is dominant on the oceans, and Napoleon realizes that they can't. He can't invade Great Britain by sea. He can't. Uh, he can't uh, do anything in the water with Great Britain kind of pestering him. So what he tries to do is declare economic warfare, economic warfare on Great Britain, and he institutes. He institutes at the end. He institutes at the end of 1806 the continental system. So I'll put this right here. This is in November of 1806. So this is right after he trounces the Prussians at Jena Austed. Jena Austed. So this is in November of 1806, where he's feeling really good about his strength on the actual continent. He institutes what he calls the continental system. Continental. Continental system. And this is really just a notion of economic warfare with Great Britain. That, hey, if you are either part of the French Empire, controlled by the French Empire, or French Empire, or aligned with the French Empire, you embargo Great Britain, this little island. It controls the waters, but it's dependent on trade. So Napoleon's idea through this continental system is to embargo, embargo. The, the United Kingdom of, you know, we could, we could call it Great Britain, whatever we want to call it, embargo Great Britain. Embargo, embargo Great Britain. And one thing he got out of the Russians, this was actually a huge concession because Russia was a major power at the time. He, he got them, through the Treaty of Tilsit, to also join the continental system. Join the continental. Let me write that in a color that'll actually show up. 
join the continental continental system. And in return, he also got some land, some islands, the, the Ionic Islands off the coast, the western coast of Greece, and some some of the uh, some of the land off the Dalmatian coast. Let me show you right there. So this area over here. And Russia in return, and you know it's pretty good because Russia essentially lost the war, but in return they were allowed to do whatever they want with the Ottoman Empire. And we'll talk more about the Ottoman Empire in future videos, but if you want to have a general view of what the Ottoman Empire is, I guess the the last the last remnant of it is what is today modern Turkey, but uh, obviously it was a, it was an empire at that time. But Russia and the Ottoman Empire were kind of at at odds with each other, so it was great for Russia to say, "Hey, I'm going to be able to do whatever I want with the Russia with, with the Ottoman Empire." Because before this, Napoleon was was nominally aligned with the Ottomans, so this was actually a big concession for Russia. So at the end of this, we have a situation once again. I guess the other powers don't realize it. Over and over, third coalition. Napoleon, he he does, you know, he he really takes care of the Russians and the Austrians. Destroys the Holy Roman Empire, makes it the Confederation of the Rhine under Napoleon's control. Prussia thinks, you know, wants to put down Napoleon, declares war again, fourth coalition. The only byproduct of that is now they lose this land. Napoleon becomes even stronger and puts his king, his his brother as king in the kingdom of Westphalia. And now he has Russia as an ally to uh, help his embargo on England. So really after after the end of the fourth coalition, a lot of a lot of historians view this as kind of the height of Napoleon's power in in Europe